Welcome back to Work in the Field, and today we're back in the bridge where I'm going to give you a full tour of all of that equipment over there. Let's start with RADAR. It stands for Radio Detection and Ranging, and it's just one of many acronyms I'm going to be using today. In addition, I'm going to be making plenty of reference to the Colrex, so if you'd like to follow along, please do download your very own copy of MSN 1781 from the link in the description below. Now, I'm sure you've all seen one of these things before. It's in standby mode at the moment because we're in port, but this is the one where the scanner spins around and paints little green dots all over the screen. We refer to those green dots as targets, and the scanner is placed up on the mast nice and high where it's got the best possible chance of seeing all of the targets in the area. We control the radar using this panel here and one of the most important uses of the radar is in fulfilling rule 7 of the Colrex which asks us to use all available means appropriate in the prevailing circumstances and conditions to determine if risk of collision exists. It also says that proper use shall be made of radar where operational and fitted. For this reason, this particular radar set has an automatic tracking aid, which allows us to automatically track the range, course, speed, closest point of approach and time to closest point of approach of a range of different targets. There are two types of radar, the X-band and the S-band, and where a yacht only has one radar, it will be an X-band. The X-band radar is better for collision avoidance, it's more accurate and it works better at close range. For that reason, that's what we've got, an X-band radar. One radar set, one radar scanner. But on some yachts, you'll notice that they've got two radar scanners, and that second radar will probably be an S-band. You can tell it's an S-band because when you look at them, the radar scanner is much longer. The S-band is for longer range. It's much more powerful, and it's got a much larger wavelength. As a result, it must have a bigger scanner. The S-band radar is also much better at seeing through rain. Ah, why do I do these things? Okay then, moving on, and the engineers are going to like this one, because here we've got the control panel for the PTO pumps. PTO, it stands for power takeoff. We've got four pumps, one connected to each of the main engines, and then one connected to each of the generators. This PTO pump is connected to the port side main engine. It's fed with hydraulic oil. The pump then pressurizes that oil and it's sent out through these orange pipes through a distributor which then pushes it to wherever it's needed, such as the captain's fore and aft, the stabilizers, or the bow and stern thruster. Next door to the PTO pump controls, we've got the controls for both of the steering pumps. Moving along now, and we've got controls for some deck lights, and then controls for nav lights. Rule 23, power-driven vessels. For a vessel of this size, that's going to be one masthead light, port and starboard side lights, and a stern light. NUC, rule 27, vessel not under command, that's going to be two all-round reds. Rule 30, anchored vessels. For a vessel of this size, that's going to be one all-round white. Here we've got controls for the exterior cameras. You'll see got that set to the starboard hand main deck. Really useful when we're underway. Officer of the watch can send the lookout for a round of the yacht. They can keep an eye on them, make sure they haven't fallen over the side. Similarly, when we're in port, set that to the main deck aft, watching the passerelle, extra security. Last one along this top row is the searchlight. That's up on the mast. It's funny because he looks like Wally. Below the searchlight controls, you've got controls for your bow and stern thruster, and they use the same hydraulic system that's controlled by the PTO pumps we had a look at earlier. The remainder of these buttons down here control the rest of these screens, things such as the vessel monitoring system and the electronic chart system, for which I also have a mouse and keyboard on the chart table. Okay then, let's keep this thing moving, and next up we've got the Doppler speed log, which measures both speed through the water and speed over ground. But we must be careful here, because the Doppler speed log feeds the radar, and for the automatic tracking aid on the radar to work properly, this must be set to speed through the water. Next door to that, and I'm sure you've seen 
one of these before, that's an echo sounder that measures the depth, but be careful here because you'll see it says 2.6 meters, but it's actually reading from below the keel. So the total depth is 2.6 plus the draft, 2.7, so that makes for a total depth of 5.3 meters. Controls for the wipers. I just washed those windows. Magnetic compass, rudder angle indicator, autopilot, and the helm or wheel. Next up is the horn or whistle. You can either get straight on the horn here, or we've got some presets, rule 34, maneuvering and warning signals, and then up the top, rule 35, sound signals in restricted visibility. Time for me to tackle these three bad boys along the back here, and I've got some real good acronyms coming your way now. Let's start with AIS, Automatic Identification System. And for any vessel over 300 gross tons, it is mandatory to carry this system. Basically, broadcasts information such as dimensions, position, course over ground, speed over ground, navigational status, and it lets other vessels, plus vessel traffic services in the area, know what we're up to. More importantly, it lets us know what they are up to. And their information can be overlaid on the radar, can also be overlaid on the electronic chart system. So it's a real helpful aid to navigation. Satellite compass. Many ships will have a gyro compass. We don't, we have this sat compass, but it serves the same purpose. It's not affected by magnetism and it's very important for giving true heading data to the radar. You may notice that there's a few degrees difference between the sat compass and the magnetic compass, and this has to do with variation and deviation. Variation can be found on the chart. It's different depending where in the world that you are, and deviation is specific to every vessel. This vessel has a deviation card. It all has to do with the fact that the ship generates its own magnetic field, and it can affect the compass. So you will need to apply the correct values of variation and deviation, and that will get you the difference between the two. GPS, Global Positioning System. This is responsible for giving us an accurate position. GPS falls under the umbrella of GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. And a couple of other examples of these systems are Galileo and GLONASS, so don't go thinking that GPS is the only one, but they all consist of a load of satellites whizzing around the Earth. The unit is able to lock on to the satellites that it can see, and from that it can fix its position on the Earth. The location from the GPS is fed to the electronic chart system, and while 99.999% of the time it is incredibly accurate, it is not perfect, and it should not be used in isolation, which is why we use other position-fixing methods, such as taking ranges with the radar, or just looking out the window and taking bearings of objects that we can see around us. The position derived from other position fixing methods can be compared with the position given by the GPS and if the two match up, happy days. If the two don't match up then one of them must be wrong, in which case it's time to investigate further. Bunwas Bridge Navigational Watch Alarm System stops the officer of the watch from falling asleep. It's got a little timer in it, timer counts down, and if the button is not pressed, sets off an alarm. Other ships might have some sort of a motion sensor, so if they don't detect any motion for a given period of time, they'll also set off the alarm. Main engine throttles, port, starboard, it's also got a little function called trolling. You better not leave me a nasty comment. Start and stop for the main engines. Emergency stop up the top here. Over to the final section now, and this is all of the GMDSS equipment, with the exception of this little fella here. That's the loud hailer. There are speakers and microphones down on the foredeck at each of the wing stations, down in the emergency steering, and we've also got a speaker up on the mast. I simply take the microphone, press the button, speak into it, and then that will be broadcast to the station that I have selected on the panel. Work on a super yacht. Move up through the ranks and maximize your potential. Thanks, Matthew. And then, as I said before, the rest is all GMDSS equipment, Global Maritime Distress and Safety System, which means that if we get into trouble out there, 
we've got a number of different ways to call for help. VHF radio, MFHF radio, Navtex can't call for help on that but you can receive warnings, and the SAT-C. We've been asked before about how we would call for help, let's say in a Mayday situation. Let's say we use the VHF radio, it's the same as for any other ship. Mayday, 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 ship name, ship name, ship name, call sign, MMSI, and then into the message. Mayday, ship name, call sign, MMSI, and then position, nature of the distress, assistance required, number of persons on board, additional information, over. If all else fails, you haven't got time to make the call, you've got these little distress buttons, they're all covered by little flaps, the SAT-C's got one too, and that's going to send out all the necessary information and that should be picked up by the authorities and other ships in the surrounding area and help should come your way. Whether you're working out on deck, on the interior, in the galley or in the engineering department, you may be called to stand as a lookout and so it's good practice to have an idea of how all of this stuff works. If you want to work your way up to deck officer level, you really need to know how it all works. Not just what it does, but the technology behind it. Because that's all part of the navigation and radar course and exam, and it's also stuff that you might be questioned on in your OOW 3000 oral exam. For this reason, I always carry this little book with me. Seamanship Notes by Angus Ferguson. If you can get yourself a copy, I highly recommend it. It's got a little bit of everything in it. it covers a lot of this technology, also about GMDSS procedures. It's got all of the coal regs in it. It's just fantastic to dip in and out of whenever I get a spare chance. If you can't get your hands on this one, I highly recommend looking at some of the other options out on the market. It's just so handy to have. You can dip in anytime, on the train, on the plane, wherever you are, learn a little bit here and there. It's good preparation for your exam and for your career as an officer. Thank you so much for watching and for other videos about life working on board a super yacht, please do check out the rest of the channel. With respect to this video, if you found some value in it, a like would be fantastic, a sub would be amazing, and I very much look forward to seeing you next time.